الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد عائشة narrates that the Prophet peace be upon him and his family was bewitched until he imagined that he had done a thing which he had not done at all. The first of our loud salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. A second even louder salawat in honor of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi wa sallam. A third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Allah. <laughs> Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. <laughs> was the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, a man who was bewitched? Did a magic spell affect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi? Was he a man who was under the black magic of someone in his community? Indeed, such a question arises when one examines the hadith narrated by Aisha, wife of the Prophet, in Sahih al-Bukhari. Indeed, this hadith raises a number of question marks on the infallibility of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. Because we know that every single school in the religion of Islam adores and reveres the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Irrespective of whichever sect you follow, irrespective of whichever school you follow, you'll find that at one stage or another in your life, you'll always mention his name. Every single Muslim in the world today, in one way or the other, will always say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Because each and every Muslim aspires to try and follow his teachings. Each and every Muslim has that reverence towards him, towards his character. But the reality is that this hadith highlights that there is a clear difference between the depiction of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, in the different schools of the religion of Islam. Because if you were to ask any Muslim in the world today, each and every one of them, would want to look after the image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Quite literally and metaphorically, as in literally a person you will see riot or demonstrate if they saw, for example, that someone drew a depiction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, or that someone mocked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If now in Paris, for example, a magazine makes fun of the Prophet, then automatically every Muslim would be insulted. That how could you say, for example, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is a man affected by Satan, a man who's the Antichrist, a man who caused war, a man of lust, a man of many marriages. No Muslim would ever allow for the image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to be insulted because for every Muslim, you would find them saying that the purest, greatest man who was untainted in his character was the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. That's why, for example, when we look at the Bible in contrast to the Quran, in the Bible, the way some prophets are tainted is something that we'd never accept. When I see in the Bible, for example, Noah becoming drunk, or I see Lut alayhi salam sleeping with his daughters and committing incest. Or I see Dawood alayhi salam getting the general killed so that he could commit zina with his wife. Naturally, such depictions are things I'll never accept. If someone today came and said to you that Nabi Dawood committed adultery, would you accept it or not? You'd never accept it. If someone came and told you Nabi Nuh was a drunkard, would you accept it or no? <clears throat> no chance. 
If someone came and told you that Lot committed incest, you'll never accept it. Therefore, for us, every prophet of God is someone who A, was guided by God, B, purified by God, C, shaitan could never affect them. Shaitan, no doubt, was an enemy to each and every one of them. There is no doubt that every prophet of God, there was shaitan trying to get in the way of that prophet. But there is no way for us that a shaitan could ever get to them. Nabi Nuh, Nabi Musa, Nabi Ibrahim, all of them, one by one, were seen as being pure and infallible. When I therefore come to the greatest of those prophets, peace be upon him and his family, and I ask any Muslim in the world today, did you believe that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi could be ever affected, for example, bewitched, for example, Satan affects him, for example, then you'll see that all Muslims will say to you, no way, the Prophet is the greatest creation of God. No one comes near the Prophet. There's no way the Prophet could be bewitched. You say to them, why? They'll say to you, well, if the Prophet, for example, could be affected by Satan, then there's no way that I'll know what of his message is from God and what of his message is from Satan. If now you say to me, for example, that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, was affected by what? Was affected by black magic. Then I'll turn around to you and I'll say to you, then I cannot trust the message. This hadith in question highlights a major problem. Why? Because when I read a hadith that says that the Prophet was bewitched, straight away I begin to reassess the whole of my understanding of prophethood. Even then at the same time, I began to ask myself a question. That is, that in my conception of Nubuwa and Risala, what is the definition of a Nabi and a Rasul? When every Muslim in the world today, you hear them talking, for example, about Shia Sunni unity. How many times do you hear people saying, that we should have Shia Sunni unity. No doubt, we should have Shia Sunni unity on the social level. Every single one of us, irrespective of our differences, socially, we all need to coexist peacefully. But on the theological level, when a person says, and you always hear this either from Mumbar or from someone at home, where they say that we all believe in the same God, and we all believe in the same prophet. At that moment, I beg to differ. Why? Because when I examine such hadiths, I begin to ask, is the prophet of the Shia the same as the prophet of other schools in Islam? Because for me, when I come to my prophet, peace be upon his family, I have a certain criteria of what that prophet is. When someone tells me all Muslims agree on the Prophet, I say yes. All Muslims agree on him being the final Prophet of God. All Muslims agree on him being the greatest. But not all Muslims agree about the purity of his life. There is a difference between the way the Shia represents Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and any other school. How many times do you hear other schools, what do they say to you? Other schools in Islam say to you that you Shia don't respect Rasulullah as much as you respect his family. Don't you hear that? Sometimes even in our own families, <coughs> you'll hear people saying that why don't us Shia mention Rasulullah more? Our brothers in other schools in Islam seem to mention him more than we do, seem to respect him more than we do, seem to honor him more than we do. I say to them, have you opened Bukhari and Muslim or not? Have you opened these works or not? Because for me, when I examined this hadith of Aisha shortly, for me, this isn't a topic to break the Muslim community. Because someone might say that why can't we focus on the akhlaq of Rasulullah? Why can't we focus on the lessons from the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi? For me, it's not about not focusing on those things. 
I'm sure in the past I've given a couple of lectures on those things. But for me, discussing this topic is a topic of salvation. Why? Because ultimately, if I want to protect the image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, the work has to start at home, not outside. At the end of the day, if I see Charlie Hebdo writing in their magazine something mocking Rasulullah, or I see in a syllabus in a school in Bradford or in Birmingham, someone saying something against the Prophet, before I go and correct the non-Muslim, maybe I need to correct my own books about Rasulullah. How many times have you seen the Muslims get angry when a non-Muslim insults the character of their prophet and they demonstrate and they write petitions and they stand outside schools. Habibi, first clean up the work in your own house before you clean up the community. At the beginning, first look at your own literature and then go and tell others not to insult Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. When we look at this hadith therefore tonight, we'll realize that the way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi is depicted in other schools in Islam is different from the way Ahlul Bayt depict Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Let us tonight examine the image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi in Sunni and Shia literature and see the difference that exists between the Rasulullah of Imam al-Sadiq and the Rasulullah of others. And I'd like to examine this in the following stages. Number one, this hadith. What does Aisha say happened to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family? Number two, if Rasulullah could be bewitched, then how could I trust what comes out of the words and the mouth of this man? Number three, why did Salman Rushdie write the satanic verses? And which verses were meant to be affected Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi because of shaitan's influence on him. Number four, what if there are such things in my Shia books? Do I accept them automatically or do I make it clear that anything that contradicts the Quran cannot be taken? Number five, what about certain ayahs in the Quran that maybe hint that the Prophet made a mistake? or that the Prophet was a sinner. Number six, therefore, how do I define what is the isma of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Number seven, how do I define the infallibility of the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? And finally, what's the biggest insult on Rasulullah? A French magazine or the butchering of his grandchildren? Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, arguably the two most famous books in the Muslim world. Irrespective of whatever madhab you follow, there's no doubt that if you're Shia or not Shia, you would have heard of Bukhari and Muslim. As in sometimes I used to always say that some Shia are able to name you Bukhari and Muslim and they cannot name you your own books. True? If you ask some of the Shia, what are the books of the Sunni world? They'll say to you, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Tirmidhi, Nasa'i. You say, what's your books? Many of them say, well, I'm not sure which ones are my books. Some might mention Nahj al balagh others might mention others. The reality is Bukhari and Muslim are amongst the most famous works. In Sahih al-Bukhari, this hadith is narrated by Aisha, the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Listen to what Aisha says. Aisha says that the Prophet was bewitched. Hadith clear. The Prophet was bewitched. An Aisha and an Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Suhira. He was bewitched. And then he began to imagine that he had done something which he actually had not done at all. Imagine if I read that hadith, that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, was bewitched. How was he bewitched? Let's see what it says. 
Aisha says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi came to me one day and he had fallen under a magic spell. Listen to this wonderful narration of your prophet. Focus here, please. He had fallen under a magic spell. When he had fallen under a magic spell, she said he began to think that he had done something which he had not done. So he said to me that I have prayed to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the cure for this magic that's affected me. What was the cure? He said, I saw a man sitting by my head and another man sitting by my feet. And the two of them were talking to each other in front of me. This is your prophet, not mine. Your prophet. The two of them were talking to each other. Rasulullah, I just want you to imagine your prophet sitting and he's just seen two random guys there. And one is talking to the other. And what are they saying to each other? One said to the other, what's wrong with this guy? Says he's been bewitched. Says by who? Says by Labid ibn al-Asam. He said, and how? He said with a comb with some hair on it and the pollen of a male palm date. Then he said, then what happened? Said then after that, where was this placed? It was placed in the bottom of a well. And that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells Aisha that I placed it there. It was there at the bottom of the well. She said, did you take it out? He said, no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the magic from me. And then having removed the magic, I didn't want to take it out because I didn't want that evil to possibly affect my people. Let's examine this hadith step by step. Firstly, what does it say? The prophet was bewitched. He began to think that he had done something which he had not actually done. In English, that normally is called hallucination. Would you agree or no? That could also go to borderline schizo. If not, bipolar on a different level. Would you agree or no? That a person says, I think I've done this, I haven't done this. Even it may go towards OCD. MashaAllah, my prophet has fulfilled the whole of the DSM criteria. On the one hand, he is what? On the one hand, hallucinating. Did I? Didn't I? This is what we call Shek Central. Then after that, I'm not sure. Maybe I did it. It's black magic. It's been affecting me. Then after that, what was the issue, by the way, that he was uncertain about? That he thinks he did, but he's not sure. Do you know what the issue is? The tafsir of it is... He wasn't sure whether he was one, with one of his wives or with another of his wives. One thing I never understand is me and you, who are not prophets of God, do we discuss our bedroom life? I ask you. Me and you, we're not prophets of God. There is a certain line that you draw about your private life, isn't it? You'll never tell anyone about what's happening in your private life. The unusual thing about Bukhari and Muslim is that they don't have a problem mentioning what? They don't have a problem mentioning the private bedroom life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In which sense? In the sense that if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was in a state of janaba, they'll say the Prophet was in a state of janaba. Me and you sitting over here, we will not even tell our closest that we're in a state of jannah, but there's a certain line of the language that we use. I will not say, for example, that I was in a state of jannah, but nor will I reveal it as a hadith for the public to find out. Because when you are the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, the Quran says, لَسْتُنَّ كَأَحَدٍ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ You are not like any other wives. إِنَ اتَّقَيْتُنَّ If you have taqwa, if you truly have taqwa, you are not like any other of the wives. But if that taqwa begins to go, then you are like any other lady. Firstly, 
The bedroom is discussed. The state of Janaba is blatantly discussed. The life, and I'm not going to use all the language that I can use because the crowd ages is too varied, mashallah. Even the life of the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. How many wives did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi have? He had a number of wives. Some might mention 9, 10, 11. Rasulullah was hallucinating over what? Was I with this wife? No, I was with her. No, I was with her. Actually, was I with her? What's happened to him? He's been affected by what? By black magic. Now, black magic, at the best of times, has no such thing and no such effect on us. Normally, black magic is one of those grandmother stories that you hear, yes? Sometimes you hear a marriage, someone saying, that you know what, I think I have magic that's been done on me. Baba, there's no magic done on you. Number one, in many cases, you're not worth magic being done on you. You, may Allah bless you, have given yourself too high a status. There is no one in the world who's envious of you. You have to get this into your head quickly. In many cases, when a person says, Wallah, I have so much hasad. Hasad for what? For what? What's the hasad for? In some cases, you might find, yes, there might be someone in your family who does go to one of these witch doctors or goes to one of these people and says, listen, is there any way? Listen to how the hadith says it blatantly. You know, sometimes you'll find someone tells me, Sayyid Ammar, and I get many of these messages where people say to me, I've been affected by black magic. And these messages, I must be very truthful here. Many of these messages, when they reach me, I forward it straight to another Mawlana. The Mawlanas I forward it to, many of them call me, they're like, you won't believe it. In the last month, I've had a sudden increase of black magic questions. Yes? Many of them don't know that I've forwarded it straight away. Why? Because when you read it, what does it say? I found some hair in my room. Wallah, there's a good chance there could be hair in your room. At the end of the day, the hair does fall off every once in a while. Someone says, but Sayyidna, there was a whole bunch of hair in my room. Whole bunch of hair in the room. Yes, it could happen from yourself. And yes, it may even happen that you may have an auntie. There's always that one auntie in the wedding photo who's giving a dirty look when you're smiling. You've seen that or no? You look at the wedding photos and you see everyone smiling. There's one like that. That auntie, just because she's looking like that at you, doesn't mean that she's doing black magic on you. Black magic cannot affect you if you are A, someone of Tahara and not Najasa. Yes? If you are someone who's Tahir, there is no Najasa in your house, then black magic will come nowhere near you. B, if you're someone who pays Sadaqa, black magic will never affect you. C, if you are someone who reads the Quran in your house, black magic will not affect you. Therefore, I ask all of you, if you say, O oh, Aisha in Sahih al-Bukhari, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was bewitched. If I look at that criteria, if someone has a house of tahara, they can never be affected by black magic. How about the man Allah purified? That's number one. Number two, if someone pays sadaqah, that black magic cannot affect them. How about the man for whom sadaqah is haram for him to take? For he is the meaning of honor, the meaning of dignity. Number three, if black magic cannot affect someone who recites the Quran in their house, how about the man who came with the Quran? Therefore, what does the hadith say? She says, that the Prophet said, Labid ibn al-A'sam. Who's Labid ibn al-A'sam to affect Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? How could someone random affect a man who when from a young age, everyone focus on this, from a young age, a man who was protected by Jibra'il and Mikail. Do you know Halima Sa'diya, what she says? Halima Sa'diya says, from the age of one, he used to speak. When I'd put food in front of him, he would, as soon as he sees that food, 
he would say, Bismillah, Rabbi Muhammad. And then when he'd finish food, he would also say what? He would say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbi Muhammad. She would say this was a man that when he would walk, the heat and the cold could never touch him. You know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa could never be affected by heat or cold. It was a mu'jizah given to him in his childhood. Number three, this was a man that whenever he'd be in a house, the light would shine up the heavens and the earth in front of him. Number four, this was a man when he was so young, as soon as he touched a tree, the leaves of that tree would blossom. I ask you, a man like that, who was a prophet of Allah from the day that he was born, could a man like that be affected by the random black magic of a random person? There is no way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who protected Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in every aspect of his life, no way that Rasulullah could be bewitched for these reasons. Therefore, for us, when I look at Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, both of them narrate that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was bewitched. Another point that comes, which is what? If he was bewitched, then I don't know when he tells me about something, whether he's been affected by magic or whether he's getting this from Jibra'il alayhi salam. True? At the end of the day, if you know somebody who hallucinates, everybody focus on this point. If you know someone who hallucinates, or you know someone schizo, you know someone bipolar, when they come and tell you something, what's the first thing you think? I think he's on it again. True? Honestly. There are some people you meet, he comes and tells you something, you're like, mm, there's a reason his eyes are red tonight, mashallah. And there's a reason he sprayed the whole car as soon as Sayyid came in the car. And that's not because he wants Sayyid to smell nice, but rather there's been a couple of substances in there. When someone hallucinates, when they come and tell you a big story, you're like, mm, I'm not sure about that story to tell you the truth. I ask you, if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was bewitched, would you trust what he tells you about God? Would you even trust what he tells you about what he receives from God? Would you trust what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells you about what will happen in the future from the ilm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given him? Therefore, for us, the Shia, the whole idea that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was bewitched, we reject straight away. Someone says, wait, us and our Sunni brothers all believe in the same prophet. I say, yes, but my prophet will never be bewitched. That's number one. Number two, what does it go on to say? Firstly, Rasulullah bewitched. What else does the other school in Islam say? Rasulullah could be affected by shaitan when verses are revealed on him. How many of you, you could even put your hands up, how many of you have heard of the famous book, The Satanic Verses? Yes? The Satanic Verses caused uproar, especially in this part of the world, about how many years ago? About 35 years ago. If you were living in Manchester, or you were living in Bradford, or you were living across the UK, Salman Rushdie's satanic verses was literally being burnt in the streets. Why did he write a book called Satanic Verses? He didn't write it because he randomly came up with the name. In Sunni thought, there were certain scholars who had narrated that when certain ayahs of Surah al najm were revealed to the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, Shaitan came in the middle of the revelation of those ayahs. Many of you have read those ayahs in the Quran when the ayahs talk about Allah and it talks about who? And it talks about Uzza, all of the idols of Quraysh. And then it says what? That Shaitan affected Rasulullah when these ayahs of Surah Al Najm were being revealed. Imagine. The Holy Prophet would have verses of Quran revealed to him. Whenever verses would be revealed, the Prophet would recite those verses. All of a sudden, 
when he mentioned Allat, Wal Uzza, Wa Manat, which were the gods of Quraysh, the idols of Quraysh, they say Shaytan affected him by saying what? Tilka al gharaniq al ula wa inna shafa'atahunna la turtaja. What did the Quran, what did the uh, Shaytan do? Shaytan whispered into the ears of the Prophet to affect the wahi that's come from Jibra'il. What did Shaytan whisper? These are the lords or the idols, the highest ones, and I seek their intercession. Imagine, this is in where? In Muslim books, where? Another school in Islam. And that's why Salman Rushdie, when he titled the book, what was the title in Arabic? Al-Ayat al-Shaytaniya. Why Al-Ayat al-Shaytaniya? Because he said in Islamic literature, you guys say, your book say, stop saying non-Muslims insult him. Your book say that the man A was bewitched, the man B, Shaytan could affect his Wi-Fi system with Jibra'il. That when Jibra'il would bring him ayahs, Shaytan could affect those ayahs. Do we, as Shia, believe that Shaytan could affect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? I ask all of you. Do we believe that Shaytan could ever affect the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family? No chance. There is no way. Why? If shaitan can affect him, then why am I calling him a rasul? Why? For what reason? Then I can be a rasul as well. I sometimes memorize. I know hadith. I know stories. Shaitan affects me as well. So what's the difference between me and him? For us, there is no way that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi or any prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could ever be affected by shaitan in any way. Number two, number three, number one, bewitched. Number two, affected by shaitan. I ask all of you a question. If in the madrasa on a Saturday or Sunday when you were growing up, if your muallim or your muallima, your mudarras, the mudarrasa, whoever, if they said to you, part one of usul al-deen on Nubuwa, Muhammad was bewitched, what would you do to the teacher? What would you do? Say what? My prophet was bewitched. Lesson two. Muhammad could be affected by shaitan. You're like, give me a break. Find me another religion for the love of God. I am not a Christian because I don't believe the biblical stories about the prophets of God in their entirety. True? Don't get me wrong. I'm not Muslim Shia because mom and dad are. I couldn't care less what my parents are. I care where haq is. My parents being Shia, I don't care. I care where haq is. I could have been Christian. At the end of the day, Usul al-Din allows me free thought of what religion I follow. I could have been Christian when I saw Nabi Lot in the Bible, slept with his daughters, and I saw David committing zina, and I saw at the same time someone like Noah drunk. I said, I cannot accept the Bible because the Bible made the prophets of God seem erratic. I ask you all a question. When you are a Muslim, and you follow the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. If the first lesson was that he's bewitched, would you follow him? If the second lesson was that he's affected by shaitan, I want to show you clearly my prophet and others' prophet is not the same prophet. Second lesson, shaitan. Third lesson, what's the third lesson? Let me get my phone out if you don't mind. I rarely do this, but I thought tonight I would do it. Why? Because I wanted to read it for you verbatim, but read it for you in a different way. There's a book recently written, you could all get hold of it, The Cambridge Companion to Classical Islamic Theology. Do you like those titles? This is so sophisticated. The Cambridge Companion to Classical Islamic Theology, edited by Tim Winter. You've heard of Tim Winter? Oh, come on. Any of you have heard of Abdul Hakim Murad? Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad. How many of you have heard Sheikh Hamza Yusuf? Abdul Hakim Murad, English. Do you know, by the way, football fans over here, 
Not that I want to talk about your football club at the moment. Football fans over here, how many of you have heard of the British football journalist, Timothy Winter, Tim Winter? Yes, famous football journalist, uh, sorry, Henry Winter. Many of you have heard of Henry Winter, famous football journalist. His brother, Tim Winter. Tim is one of the renowned scholars in the Western world when it comes to what? When it comes to classical Sunni Islam and classical Sufism. Are you all with me? So if you type on YouTube, Sheikh Abdel Hakim Murad, you'll see an Englishman with like a ginger beard, very renowned scholar online, very renowned. The Cambridge Companion to Classical Islamic Theology, edited by Tim Winter. Chapter nine, Revelation. Nice. Chapter nine is on what? Revelation in Arabic, what is it? Revelation in Arabic, Wahi. This article is written by Professor Yahya Mishoh. Yahya Mishoh was a colleague of mine when I was Imam Ali Chair of Shia Studies at the Hartford Seminary in America. Yahya Mishoh is a renowned academic. He specializes in Islamic history and Islamic theology. Let's come to his discussion of revelation. This is a wonderful discussion. Allah. Let's see the prophet of God, how he was in revelation. Let's go here. The revelation of the Quran, everybody focus on this. The revelation of the Quran itself spread over 23 years. We all agree. Yep. It started during the month of Ramadan. We all agree. During a spiritual retreat of the Prophet Muhammad on Mount Hira, we all agree? Outside Mecca, Jibra'il appeared to Muhammad and then taught him the first five verses of which surah? Alaq, yep. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, iqra. Bismil rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insan min iqra wa rabbuka alladhi allama bil, allama al-insan ma'ala. According to Aisha, reporting directly from the Prophet, whom she would later marry, it happened in the following way. Are you ready for this or no? Are you ready? No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Before I say to you, are you ready? Sometimes someone says, but Sayyidna, if we discuss these things, we're going to have difference between Sunni and Shia Baba for the love of mankind. Wallah, everyone is entitled to follow what they want to follow. I know when I discuss something, why do I always have to walk on eggshells? I'm a Shia and I have iftikhar on my tashayya. And I don't want to disrespect. I am reading classical Islamic theology text. Very posh. It happened in the following way. Wahi. Allah, my prophet, Nubuwa 101. Angel came to the prophet, asked him to read. The prophet replied, I don't know how to read. Prophet added, the angel then caught me, pressed me so hard that I could not bear it anymore. What is this, a boxing ring or a wahi? What is this? This man is the Habib of Allah. I ask all of you, your mother's Habib, her child, how does your mom treat your child? When your mom was teaching you how to read or your dad, were they pressing your chest hard? I know some of you here will say, maybe. <laughs> but in many cases, they were treating us with love. The angel then caught me and pressed me so hard that I could not bear it anymore. He then released me and asked me to read, and I replied, I don't know how to read. Thereupon he caught me again and pressed me a second time and asked me to read. I could not bear it anymore. He then released me and again asked me to read. I said, I don't know how to read. Thereupon he caught me for the third time and pressed me and then released me and said, read in the name of your Lord. 
And then he goes on. Following a pause, listen to this. During which the Prophet became, everyone listen to this, Cambridge, mashallah. Because you know our people, as soon as they hear Cambridge, ooh, Cambridge, thaqafa, duktorna, relaxna. Following a pause during which the Prophet became depressed to the point of considering suicide. The Prophet considered committing what? Suicide. How many of you have heard the story? He was thinking of jumping off the mountain. You've heard the story or no? The man, they say, had an epileptic fit. Allahu Akbar. I, I'm not sure. Is this the same man who you say that if an English guy in Birmingham insults him or in Manchester insults him, the whole mosque stands outside that school wanting to burn the teacher. True? Ya Ammi, clean up the house before you clean up the world. Number one, bewitched. Number two, Satan. Number three, suicidal. Look at what we Shia say about this incident. No such thing as suicidal. Rather, Rasulullah was a prophet from the day he was born. The same way Jesus said, Inni Abdullah, Atani al Kitab wa Ja'alani Nabiya. If Jesus knew he was a prophet from the day he is born, Muhammad, who's greater than all prophets, did not know. Rasulullah was guided throughout his life. What then happened at the age of 40? Many times, even we say the words wrong. People say Rasulullah became a prophet at 40. That's wrong. Rasulullah announced his prophethood at 40. Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi had already been a prophet waiting for revelation, waiting, waiting, waiting. When Jibra'il came to him and said, Iqra, recite, he said, What would you like me to recite? Simple. No suicide mission, no jumping off a mountain, no losing it completely. What would you like me to recite? Iqra, bismi rabbi, Iqra, bismi rabbi. Khalaq al no problem. And he would just follow it softly. Then, what do they say? They say that Rasulullah, he was considering suicide. Shall I jump off the cliff? Shall I jump off the mountain? He then went home to say the Khadija. When he came home to say the Khadija, it's like, you know what? This has happened and I'm really worried and I might be a prophet. She is like, I can call a friend. Who, she said, my cousin Waraka bin Nofal will tell you if you're a prophet or no. Waraka bin Nofal was a Christian. But he could tell Muhammad if Muhammad was a prophet. That is when I say, please, enough. If Waraka is determining who's prophet, then I should follow Nabi Waraka. True? If Waraka is giving the stamp for who are prophets, then I should follow this guy because this guy seems to have connections. This man is the one who will know. Subhanallah, look at the Shia depiction of the prophet and others. Bewitched, number one, suicidal, satanic influence, all of these you'll find within Bukhari and Muslim. There's a question that's asked. What if I find one of these, for example, in my books? Just because something is in Shia books doesn't make it authentic. Understand one thing. Our books also got affected by Israeliyat. Our books also got affected by people fabricating. Our books also have things. But our Imam said, whenever you see a hadith, place it alongside the Quran as the barometer. If the hadith contradicts the Quran, throw that hadith away. Someone says, so how does that work? Okay, 
when I see a hadith, whether it's in my books or other books, and it says that Rasulullah was affected by shaitan, I look in the Quran, shaitan himself makes it clear that I cannot affect certain people. Someone says, how? In the Quran, Surah 38, verse number 82 to 83, what does shaitan say? فَبِعِزَّتِكَ by your glory, لَأَغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ I'll deceive all of your creation. Illa. Except, عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمْ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Except the mukhlasin of your creation. What is a mukhlas? Not mukhlis. Mukhlis with a, kis with a kisra is someone who is sincere. Mukhlas with a fatha is someone who has been purified from the need to commit a sin. Shaytan is the first proof for isma. When someone says to you, prove to me infallibility, the first proof is shaytan, which is very ironic. Because normally shaytan makes you leave infallibility. Shaytan says, Ya Allah, by your glory, I will deceive all your creation. And boy, has he done a good job. I'll deceive all of your creation, except <clears throat> those who are purified from the need to sin. There are a chosen group of your creation where I will never be able to affect them. Number one, therefore, when I see hadith, and the hadith says, Rasulullah, shaitan came and whispered to him, he got the ayah wrong, I look in the Quran, I see number one, this ayah. Number two, when I see an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We are the ones who chose them, and we are the ones who guide them onto the straight path. When Allah guides you, can anyone misguide you? When Allah guides you, can anyone come and misguide you? No way. Therefore, when someone comes and says to me that someone bewitched Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, this for me is the biggest insult on Rasulullah. Forget Charlie Hebdo, forget drawing his face with a bomb on top of it. That's not an insult. That is an insult from someone low. But when someone says, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah and says Muhammad was bewitched, that's the biggest insult on Rasulullah's character. Someone says, okay. But sometimes I see verses in the Quran. For example, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Abasa wa tawalla. And ja'ahu al-a'ma. How many of you have read Surah 80 of the Quran? He frowned and he turned when the blind man came towards him. Yes? You know what our non-Shia brethren say about this? They say that this ayah was revealed about who? Was revealed about Rasulullah. A blind man came to visit the Prophet. Everyone listen to this unbelievable akhlaq of the man who taught us akhlaq. A blind man entered upon the Prophet. The Prophet was sitting. The blind man entered. The Prophet was in a conversation with who? He was in a conversation with the Quraysh leaders. That blind man began to speak. When the Quran revealed the verses, Abasa wa tawalla and ja'ahul a'ma. He frowned and he turned when the blind man came towards him. You know what our non-Shia brethren say? And wallah, I say this here on Mimbar. Even if a Shi'i says this, I will reject what the Shi'i says. Don't think just because someone Shi'a doesn't mean that their aqidah doesn't begin to shake. Sometimes even a Shi'i can have aqidah that begins to shake. What do the non-Shi'a say on this? They say, Rasulullah, the blind man was speaking. Rasulullah frowned and he turned away from him. Why do I reject this? Number one, the Quran says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are a man of the most sublime morality. I ask everyone here and everyone watching online, have you ever in your life 
when a blind person has come towards you on, in your way, maybe walked past you with their dog guiding them, have you ever given a dirty look or a rude look to someone blind in your life? In your whole life? Wallah, whenever I see someone blind, Wallah, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the biggest wealth he has given me and that is being able to see. Many of us, we don't put life into perspective. Oh, you know what? My business is down. I'm going through so much. I hate life. Wallah, the fact that you could see every day is the biggest barakah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I see someone blind. You think I'm going to be arrogant towards them? You think I'll be rude towards them? If I won't be, you think Rasulullah would be? Therefore, firstly, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Number two, إِنَّمَا بُعِثْتُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارَمَا الْأَخْلَاقِ I have been sent to perfect the message of the prophets before me. And that's the message of akhlaq. That's number two. Number three, the Quran tells him and Allah tells him, do not push people away who come to visit you. Surely he wouldn't contradict. Number four, Imam al-Sadiq is asked, who is this ayah about? And Imam al-Sadiq replies by mentioning that this is from one of the people of Bani Umayyah, one of the caliphs of Islam. He is the one who frowned and turned. I know someone, I know someone who converted and became Shia because of this ayah. How? When he asked one of the Shia that this ayah, who is it about? One of the Shia said, this is about your Khalifa, the one from the Khulafa who is from Bani Umayyah. Yes? One of the main Khulafa who is related to Bani Umayyah. He said to him, no, this is about Rasulullah. The person replied to him, no, no, this is about your Khalifa. He said, how dare you insult my Khalifa in that way? Wallah, this person said to me, the moment I said that, I thought to myself, hold on a minute. Have I just defended a Khalifa's akhlaq ahead of Rasulullah? How many of you have heard of Mufti Menk? Mufti Menk is a very good scholar. And he's a very good speaker. And I believe, in my opinion, I believe the man is a sincere man. I have been fortunate to lecture in Africa, all over Africa. And I have lectured towards the region of South Africa. They all hail generally. There is the Indians who live in South Africa, Zimbabwe and these areas, yes? These are very good people, very pure people. Mufti Menk, wonderful memory of Quran, a man soft-hearted, he explains the revelation of Surah 48 of the Quran. Is everyone listening? Surah 48 of the Quran. Surah 48 of the Quran is called what? Surah Al-Fatih. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna fatahna laka fathan. He says, this chapter was in the context that when the Hudaybiyyah Treaty was signed, between who? When the Hudaybiyyah Treaty was signed between Rasulullah and the Quraysh, he says the second Khalifa became very angry with Rasulullah's decision to sign a treaty with his old enemies. And the second Khalifa was known on that day to have said, today I doubt his prophethood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually after Hudaybiyah treaty gave victory to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi through the opening of Mecca. All of you know the context. Do you know what Mufti Menk says? This man, you'd think a man of intellect, a man of honor. What does he say? He says, Allah revealed these verses to console Umar ibn al-Khattab in his anger against Rasulullah. Because Umar was angry with Rasulullah, Allah revealed Surah to console Umar. 
you place a fallible human above the man who Allah chose to guide humanity? No, no, he said, no, 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 no. I place Rasulullah the highest. So when Umar gets angry, we have to stop and pause the whole day until Allah reveals an ayah to console Umar becoming angry with Rasulullah. Yani, ya Mufti Mank, you are a man of high knowledge. How do you reach a conclusion that Allah will reveal a surah to console someone angry with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And that's why I say to you, Wallah, all Muslims out there adore him. They revere Rasulullah. They respect Rasulullah. Their life is for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But the saddest thing of our history is that some of them were ready to throw him under the bus to raise others or to protect others and their sins. Raise, put him under the bus so that others would be protected for the decisions that they made. Therefore, for us as Shia, number one, Rasulullah never bewitched. Never satanic influence, definitely not bipolar epileptic who's about to commit suicide. For us, Rasulullah is ma'soom. Someone says, but bro, even the non-Shia say he's ma'soom. No, non-Shia say he's ma'soom in the area of wahi, revelation. Outside of revelation, he could commit sins, he could commit mistakes. For us, Shia, my prophet, my usul deen is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi in every aspect of his life is ma'soom. Never would Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi have a wahi nine to five life and a different home life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi 24 hours of the day is the purest creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every aspect. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Let's have a second louder salawat, please. And a third in honor of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Someone says, therefore, what do you mean when you say he is ma'soom? Ha, ah, interesting question. When I say he is ma'soom, it doesn't mean that I'm saying he cannot sin. He can sin, but he chooses not to sin. What does that mean? If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa cannot sin, then to me he's like a robot. I can't relate to him. If he can't sin, I can't relate to him. You tell me the man's great, but I'll be like, but he can't sin. So how can he be great? Greatness is when you can sin, but you choose not to. Imam Zain al-Abdi was asked that when you Ahlul Bayt are ma'soom, ha, huh? notice, for the Shia, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alih, they are all ma'soomin. Someone says, how do you prove that he, yes, how about his family? Number one, you all know the main ayah that proves his family are ma'soomin is which one? Ayat al-tadhir. Inna ma yurid Allah al-yudhba ankum al-ritsa ahl al-bayti wa yutahhirakum tadhira. Allahumma salam kum adwan. The second main ayah is, the second main concept is which one? I leave behind for you the Quran and my ahl al-bayt. If the Quran is revealed from Allah with no mistakes, whatever's alongside the Quran can have no mistakes. True? Ahl al Bayt السلام, were the walking Quran. They are the ones purified by Allah. Imam Zayn al Abidin has asked the question because someone says, Ayat al Tathir is only Muhammad Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. So, how do you believe more than them? We believe more than them because the Prophet himself said there will be 12 after me. In Bukhari 
and Muslim, there will be 12 after me. Ask any Muslim in the world, if they ask you, why are you an Ithna Ashari? Why are you a 12er? Say, it's not just my books, it's your books. It says that the Prophet said there will be 12 after him. Who are these 12? I know my 12. Number one is the king of kings. True? And number two is Hassan bin Ali. And number three is the master of martyrs. And number four is Zain al-Ibad. And number five is Baqir al-Uloom. Number six, Sadiq al-Muhammad. Number seven, the Kazim al-Ghayr. Number eight, al-Radhi bil-Qadari wal-Qadha. Number nine, the man of Jude. Number 10, the Hadi. Number 11, the Askari. And the final of them, Al-Hujjah ibn Al-Hassan. Allahumma sallam. The Prophet therefore said that not only am I ma'soom, my family, Allah has kept away from them all impurities and purified them a thorough purification. Ayatollah Muhammad Baqir al may Allah bless his soul. He used to have a lovely comment when people used to say to him, you Shia believe that the prophets and the imams all ma'soom and so on and so forth. He said to them, listen, if you say they're not ma'soom, no problem. Find me 12 better people walking on the earth than them. In their time, when Ali was alive, was there anyone better than him? When Zain al-Abideen was alive, was there anyone better than him? When Imam al-Sadiq was alive, was there anyone more knowledgeable than him? When Imam al radha was alive, was there anyone more knowledgeable than him? Therefore, for us, Ahl al-Bayt already their ilm showed that they were higher than everyone, but Allah had purified them, a thorough purification. And that's why when someone comes and says the biggest insult on the Prophet today is when someone draws his face. Nah, that wasn't the biggest insult. How about when someone puts his face in a film? Nope, not the biggest insult. How about when someone makes a caricature? Not the biggest insult. These are all insults, but not the biggest. The biggest insult to the Prophet was the way they butchered his family. That was the biggest insult to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa One of the ulama, he says when the Prophet says, <coughs> that there was no prophet who was hurt like I was. <laughs> One of the ulama says, but many prophets were tortured. Many had people make fun of them. Many had people kick them out. If Muhammad got kicked out of Mecca, Moses got kicked out of Egypt. And if Muhammad had people calling him Sha'ir, then Nuh had people who used to go like this. So what does it mean no prophet was hurt like I was? What it means is no prophet's family was treated the way my family were. Wallah, I'll never forget a devastating line in Sham which breaks the heart. <clears throat> when Yazid, la'natullah alayh, when Yazid, tried to mock Imam Zain al-Abideen in Sham. And Yazid began to ask his advisors, what should we do with these young girls over here? And what should we do with these ladies? And Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam made it clear to him that Yazid, know one thing, your advisors, they are worse than the advisors of Fir'aun. Pharaoh's advisors, when Moses and Harun were caught, they at least said to them, let them go. Whereas your advisors, what they advise you against us, highlights that they are the worst. When some of them are telling you that sell them off, give them away, imprison them. That no prophet of Allah had his family killed one by one. Name me all the prophets of God you can think of. Name me all of them. And then look at their families, what happened to them. Nothing like what happened to Rasulullah and his family. 
the biggest insult in this religion's history wasn't what the Christians said about Rasulullah. It was what the Muslims done to Rasulullah and his family. That every single one of those names I mentioned was killed one by one. Every single one. Wallah, not one, not one, as Imam al Radha alayhi salam said, Ma minna illa maqtulun shaheed. There is none amongst us except that we are killed and martyred. Imam al Hassan says, Ma minna illa maqtulun wa masmoom. There's not one of us except that we were either killed or we were poisoned. Subhanallah. What does that show? That shows that every single one of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi and his family was at the receiving end of pain, of torture, of insult, and of ridicule. You look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi on a night like this, and you see that he was the first of the victims of this. Wallah. The first of them. Not only did they insult him, by calling him delirious and saying to him, the Quran is enough for us. Imagine those lines. The Quran is enough and that insult that came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. But the worst insult is that even when his grandson wanted to be buried and be near him, even Hassan bin Ali could not come near his grandfather's grave. Allahu Akbar. You cry when someone draws a cartoon about Rasulullah. That's what you get insulted by. The bigger insult is when you respect those who launched arrows on Hassan's janaza. Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam, mazloom in life. Mazloom after his death. In life, how was he mazloom? Imam al Hassan had a wasiyah. When you take my janaza, pass by the grave of my grandfather. Allahu Akbar. Sometimes, sometimes you may request this. You may tell your family that, listen, when I die, if you can, don't let me be buried too far away from mom or too far away from dad. Or maybe my janazah, let it pass through near my grandfather, Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam. What did he say? He said that all I want is for my janazah to be a janazah that I am buried in Jannatul Baqi'ah. Bury me where? Where? Jannatul Baqi'ah. Next to who? Next to my grandmother Fatima bint Asad. Imam Ali's mom. Imam Ali's mom, you know a grandmother loves her first grandchild. Imam Ali's mom loved Imam al Hassan. She raised him. So he said that my wasiyah is I want to be buried next to my grandmother Fatima bint Asad in Jannat al Baqi'ah. But as you carry my janazah, let it pass by my grandfather's grave. Subhanallah, as the janazah was coming past, you imagine, that's all you wanted for the janazah to come past. All of a sudden, someone riding a mule called out, do not allow him to be buried near my husband's grave. Mazloom al Hassan, Mazloom. And then not just Mazloom, Masmoom al Hassan, Masmoom. Poisoned Imam al Hassan. May Allah never show what happened to the children of Rasulullah. They saw their grandfather die, they saw their mother behind a door and a wall. They saw their father with his head cut. Those three in particular, Hassan, Hussein, and Zainab. Hassan, the poison affected his body, all over his body. And in the bowl, in that bowl, blood everywhere. 
And he has Imam Al Hussein next to him. And he tells Imam Al Hussein that there is no day like your day, Aba Abdullah. Allahu Akbar. And then look at the pain that he has as well, my dear brothers and sisters. He hears someone coming into the room. He says, Hussein, cover that bowl if you don't mind. The bowl with the blood. Imam al Hussein covers it. Why? Because he cannot let Zainab see this. Allah. He cannot bear that Zainab is in pain. And today, look at Imam al Hassan, all of you over here. Yes. You look at the grave of Imam al Hassan in Jannah al Baqiyah on a night like this. I ask you, how many zawar does Imam al Hassan have tonight? <laughs> People say to me that Imam al Rada is Gharib al Ghuraba. No, Alhamdulillah, Imam al Rada has many Shia around him. Imam al Rada has many lovers in Mashhad next to him. Imam al Rada has people ready to die next to him and serve him. Rasulullah is Gharib. Imam al Hassan is Gharib. Zain al Abideen is Gharib. Muhammad al Baqir is Gharib. <laughs> Sadaq is gharib. Umm al Banin is a gharib. Fatima al Zahra is a gharib. I want to narrate to you in this musibah one of the ulama who he sees a dream. A dream. In his dream, he says, I saw Hassan talking to Hussein. Allah. They are the ones who saw what happened to Rasulullah, what happened to Al Muhammad, yes? He said that I saw Imam Al Hassan talking to Imam Al Hussein, alayhi salam. And he said that Imam Al Hassan looked at Imam Al Hussein and he said to him, My brother, is it fair? Is it fair, my brother, that they poisoned me but that they beheaded you? Allahu Akbar. Imam al-Hassan is heartbroken, yes? Is it fair, my brother, is it fair that they poisoned me but that they beheaded you? He says then all of a sudden I saw Imam al Hussein with the tears in his eyes look towards Imam al Hassan and say to him, my brother, is it fair, my brother, is it fair that I have a dome on top of my grave and you have nothing on top of yours? Allah. Is it fair, my brother, is it fair that I have many zawar coming towards my grave and you have none coming towards yours? Take your hearts to Jannat al-Baqi'ah tonight. Is it fair, my brother, is it fair that I, my zawar are welcomed when they visit me? Whereas your zawar are pushed away when they visit you. Then he said to him, my brother, is it fair that I have a tariq on top of my grave in Karbala? And you have only a rock on top of yours. At that moment, Imam al Hassan looked at Imam al Hussein and said to him, Oh Hussein, remain patient. There'll be a day when people will visit me and Zain al Abideen, Muhammad al Baqir, Ja'far al Sadiq, and Umm al Banin. And all those who are will look at one thing they'll be looking for the vibrations of a broken ribbon Medina. All of these who are buried there, Zainab saw all of them one by one, yes? Zainab alayhi salam saw Rasulullah die. Zainab was the same one who saw her mother Fatima die. Zainab was the same one who saw who? Zainab also saw Imam al Hassan die. But at least with all of them, Zainab had Hussein with her all the time, yes? 
When Rasulullah died, Hussein was with Zainab. And when her mother died, Hussein was with her. And when her brother died, Hussein was with her. But when she returned to Medina on a night like this, there were no more Hassan and Hussein next to her. When she returned back to Medina, she went straight to her house. She sat in the house and called out, Where's my grandfather now? Where's my mother now? Where's my father now? Where are my brothers now? Zainab alone in the house in Medina. Zainab alayhi salam, when she was in that house, she was disconsolate, broken from Karbala, broken from what she had seen happen to her family. Who was with her in her house? Bibi Fidda, yes? Fidda was with her. She said to Fidda, she said to her Fidda, anyone who comes to visit me tell them that I'm not seeing anyone now yes I want to just be alone I've seen too many go away from me too many have left me so anyone who comes tell them I cannot see them now a few moments later the door knocked in Medina when Fidda opened the door it was Umm al at the door Allah Umm al banin at the door, she said, can I see Zainab? Fadda was confused, what do I say? Fadda came towards Zayda Zainab and said to her, you asked me not to welcome anyone. She said, yes. She said to her, but oh, Abbas's mother is at the door. At that moment, Zainab ran to the door and Umm al banin ran to Zainab. Zainab calling out Wa Abbasa and Umm al Banin calling out Wa Hussein. And both of them coming together and calling out Wa Shahida. Medina was a home for Al Muhammad, all of you know. And some of Medina, Imam could not take with him to Karbala, yes? They are the ones who in this time, they would be waiting for their family members to come back. Of them was a young daughter called Fatima al sukhra Allah. Fatima al-Halila. She had waited patiently in Medina, but she faced a very difficult moment. Why? Because she, months earlier, she had bid farewell to her father and to her uncles and to her brothers. Some of her brothers were older than her. Some had just been born. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, Medina on a night like this, Fatima al-Alila was waiting. Yes. Is there any news? Where's my father? Abdullah, tell me. Every time someone would come, no news, no news, no news. Until at this moment, she saw a lady, and the lady was Zainab. When Zainab came towards her, she said to her, Come near me. Do you know what Fatima al-Alila said to her? Who are you? Allahu Akbar. She said to her, sorry? She said, who are you, old lady? I, I, I don't know you. I ask all of you, what did Karbala do to Zainab's face? What did Kufa do to Zainab's face? What did Sham do to the face of Zainab? She said to her, I don't know you. Who are you? Why have you come to see me? Do you know anything about my father? His name is Hussein. I also had an uncle called Abbas. I had a brother, his name was Akbar. Allah. I had a, I had a sister called Sukaina. Allahu Akbar. And I had a baby, a baby called the Radhi. Abdullah Ali al Asghar, I had a baby. Oh, lady, do you know them or not? She said to her, Fatima, don't you recognize your auntie Zaina? She said to her, Auntie, that's you? Said, Yes. You know what the poet says? It's as if she said to her, Auntie, who injured your eye? 
Auntie, who injured your back? Auntie, why have you aged so much? And then she looked and said to her, Auntie, where's my baby brother? Tell me. And the auntie said they took his neck from one side to the other. And then she said at my uncle, they took his arms, both of them. And my Akbar, my Akbar, they took everything away from him. And tell me about Abba Abdullah. Where's my father? Tell me. And it's as if Zainab looked at her and said, the horses took his body one way or the other. Inna lillahi wa inna alayhi raji'oon. Let's raise our hands, my dear brothers and sisters. May Allah bless all of you. Ya Allah, raise us with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allow us to be those who protect the image of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Keep us away from all fabrications regarding his personality, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, allow us to be of those who perform the ziyara of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and let us receive the shafa'ah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Muhibban Youth Foundation, Ya Allah, allow them to continue in their services of Muhammad and al-Muhammad. This community over here in the north of England, Ya Allah, in Manchester and around Manchester, may Allah bless them and allow them to continue to be amongst the lovers of Muhammad and al-Muhammad. And those who are alongside the Imam of your time, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. There are many of you who have requested, some of you have issues in your personal life, in your public life, in your domestic lives. Some of you, your children are facing challenges.